indeed a beautiful song. I would say that's probably one of my favorite. And it even discusses some of the points that I'd like for us to discuss this morning. If you would, be turning over to the book of Ephesians, chapter 3. I'm glad to have this opportunity to speak to you this morning. I'm certainly glad for each of you being here. Throughout the book of Ephesians, we find many practical themes. Some of them state the accountability of man and conclude him dead in sin. That is, all countable individuals. We find that grace and faith have a major part to play in man's salvation. And we find that the Gentiles, those who are not Jews, were allowed to become fellow heirs, fellow heirs of this salvation. They were labeled as those who were afar off, however now are made near, and is done by the blood of Christ. They have been, they have been able to become part of the one body, just as the Jews before them at this time. Then we find in Ephesians chapter 3, beginning there in verse 1, our text. It says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in a few words whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto, unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs, and of the same body, and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Whereof I was made a minister, according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by faith of him. Wherefore, I desire that ye faint not in my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Taking this text as a whole, and really bringing it down to the last verse we read, it appears that Paul, in writing these words, seems to interrupt himself. And he's trying to take a different thought, for he brings up his imprisonment in Rome. But this is not a pity party. This is a call for unity, and it's being pointed out that it's a part of the grace of God. Now, just what grace of God was shown to Paul? Well, it now offers him the ability to present God's word, God's message, and it relates to the revelation of a mystery which has been hid for many ages. However, we must note that this mystery was being revealed through the apostles and the prophets at the time that this was being written. Thus, from our text this morning, I want us to consider three questions, or three points, rather. The fact that a mystery has been revealed, and at the time being revealed, and then what exactly is this mystery that had been hidden but now revealed, 
And just how was this mystery being revealed? Now, I do like to define some terms. What is a revelation? A revelation. It comes from the Greek term apocalypsis, which simply means a disclosure, an appearing, or a manifestation. It comes from another Greek word, apocalypto, which means to take off the cover, to disclose, or to reveal. It is very similar to when you're watching a play, that you have the set being organized or already organized for the viewers, but then it's covered by the curtain. And when you reveal that set, you bring up the curtains, or you slide them aside. And now that set has been open for the public's viewing. It has been revealed. Now what is a mystery? This term comes from the Greek word musterion, and that simply means to shut the mouth or a secret. Typically, when folks think of these two words, mystery and revelation, they assign some type of mystical idea to it, some weird spooky connotation. But if you consider what these words actually mean, there's neither of those associated with them. Something that has been hidden, but now being disclosed, being made open. This mystery now being revealed, as we just read in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, is the mystery of Christ. The Apostle Paul points out that at this time he was a prisoner of Rome, but by God's grace, this mystery was given to him, verse 2, and the mystery was revealed to him by God. This was no drug-induced coma. This was no message that had originated by any other man. This was a message that was being revealed by Jehovah God himself. Verse 3. Also consider Galatians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. He had already written to these Ephesians prior to this letter. Yet he states that by reading they too could and would understand his knowledge of the gospel, his knowledge of this great mystery. Verse 4, when you read what I know, read what I wrote, you'll understand what I know. It's quite simple. He would also pen 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, which points to the necessity of studying God's word, being much more familiar with it, growing in it, Gaining wisdom and understanding. Now implied with this statement is the simplicity of God's word. It is able to be understood. Paul expected these Ephesians to whom he wrote to be able to read the message he's giving them and to understand the words that he was using. Now we, knew, we do know from 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, that there are portions that are hard to be understood. They're difficult reading. But many today take that idea and think it's impossible to understand and not simply difficult. Calculus is difficult to understand. It is not impossible to understand. By and large, people do not want to understand it. Unfortunately, the same applies to the gospel. Some portions are difficult, but because it does take extra work, most people choose not to understand the gospel. Some think that the Bible is still a mystery. The message it contains is still mysterious and hidden. And I would say most of this comes from their misunderstanding of the term mystery itself. The gospel, however, was called a mystery because at that point in given time, it was still hidden. It was concealed. Verses 4 and 5 of Ephesians 3, which reads, Whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages, other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles, and prophets by the Spirit. 
Remember our definition of mystery. It's a secret. It's unrevealed. However, we must remember and note that the fact regarding this mystery, it is not described as something that is still hidden. And it's not something that now remains hidden. You think of mystery novels. Mystery novels are those books, uh, the whodunits. It takes you through a long line of thinking. And usually, if it's a good writer, it's somebody that you never would have expected. Now, when you read that book, does it cease to be a mystery? No. It's still classified as a mystery novel. Even though the characters, the plots, even the conclusion is now revealed to you, it is still considered a mystery novel. As the story progresses, it, sle it slowly and uh, the secret unfolds. This similar concept also applies to the mystery of Christ. It was kept secret for ages past. Yet by reading the gospel, reading the words that Paul wrote and the other writers of the New Testament, we too can understand the secret that had been kept. For the gospel was kept secret for most of man's history. Yet now in this context, in the writing of the New Testament, it is slowly being revealed to mankind. Consider Ephesians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 through 29. And Romans chapter 16, verses 25 and 26. These verses read, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. These passages further show the fact that there was indeed a mystery, and it was hidden, but no longer. It is now being revealed. And for us today, it has already been revealed. Now, what exactly has been revealed? This mystery, as we've read, involves the Gentiles. Those who are not of a Jewish descent. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 6. says that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. That means they were not before. And of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. So this mystery is the gospel of Christ. When you consider prior chapters of Ephesians, you'll note that Gentiles were once considered and were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. They were excluded from Israel. They were considered strangers from the covenants of promise. They were considered without hope and without God in the world. Now, most of that, really all of that, was their own choosing. They had the law of patriarchy to keep them close to God. Yet, by and large, they gave up God, Romans 1. Now, this secret that has now been revealed is that these same Gentiles can become fellow heirs with their Jewish brethren. They can now become members of that same saving spiritual body. As a result, they can become partakers of God's promise that is found in Christ. This is what Paul referenced in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. And it is to which he's referring in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. And this outlines basically the condition of the entire Gentile world. They were not included in God's special dealing with Israel. For remember, they were God's chosen people. He didn't give up on them. It's just that Israel had a specific purpose that was different from the rest of the world. 
Now these Gentiles would be able to become members of God's spiritual family under this new law of Christ. Thus they become heirs to the great blessing made available in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. We note that Paul was considered apostle to the Gentiles. He was commissioned specifically to teach them. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 7 through 12. Again, we'll read that. It says, Whereof I was made a minister, according to the gift of the grace of God, given unto me by the effectual working of his power. So again, this isn't something he just randomly chose a day. He was commissioned by God to go to the Gentiles, to teach them this mystery. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in the heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose of which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. As we just read, Paul was commissioned by God to preach to the Gentiles. Also consider Romans chapter 11, verses 13 through 14, Galatians chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, and Galatians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. Paul was tasked with preaching the unsearchable riches of Christ. Uh, verses 7 and 8 of our text. Paul did so by word of mouth. By writing letters such as the one we're studying this morning. Ephesians chapter 1 verses 3 through 14. This was done in order to make all people see the fellowship that is brought about by the revealing of this great mystery. Verse 9 of our text. It was done in order to show the manifold wisdom of God. Now, that's an interesting word that we typically don't refer to or use rather. Manifold. The manifold wisdom of God. This wisdom has been presented by the church. Now, oftentimes we think of it as being the gospel. And as Christians, we preach the gospel, and that's how we reveal the manifold wisdom of God. But a manifold, the idea here is it's multifaceted. If you look at a, a precious gem and you've got all these different angles and different cuts in it, it's a gorgeous rock. But because of these different facets, it shines a little better. It bends light differently as it would if it was just a block of glass. God's one singular wisdom is presented to us in different ways. We're able to see God's wisdom in different ways. Different perceptions. It applies to us differently. But it's the same wisdom. Just like the gospel. The saving message contained therein. It's approached and it's taught in different ways. Still truth, but we understand it a little bit differently, especially as we grow older. Again, the manifold wisdom of God. Paul is making the point that this wisdom is known by the epistles, which are being written and distributed among the church. The church presents the wisdom of God by proclaiming the gospel. This is one aspect of this making known the wisdom of, or the manifold wisdom of God. Thus, the message that the church teaches, and as well individual Christians, proclaims God's wisdom. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. However, a lesser known or lesser realized point is the very existence of the church points to the manifold wisdom of God. The church was always a part of God's plan. 
part of God's eternal purpose, as we just read. The church was not a plan B or an afterthought of Jesus. He didn't come here to establish an earthly kingdom. It failed because he was murdered and then established a spiritual church. That was his mission when he came to earth, to establish his church. The church has always been God's plan. We find the earliest promise of this church, really of the Messiah, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Salvation has always been in the mind of God, specifically man's salvation. 2 Timothy chapter, two, or chapter 1, verse 9, and Titus chapter 1, verse 2. Now, by, by what process was this mystery revealed? Now, we see that the establishment of the church was foretold about in prophecy. This church was said to come about during the fourth great kingdom found in Daniel chapter 2, verses 44 through 45. That great image that King Nebuchadnezzar saw in, during the time of that fourth great kingdom from that image, the church would be established. We see some of the blueprints of this, this kingdom in Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. It says, And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow into it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Similar sentiments are echoed in Micah chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, as well as Zechariah chapter 8, verse 3. Jesus proclaimed in his earthly ministry that he would build his kingdom. He would build his church, Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 18. Now Jesus gave direction as to where the mystery was to be preached, how this mystery was to be revealed. After his resurrection, he spoke with his apostles. In Luke chapter 24, verses 45 through 49, he there says, Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the scriptures, and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses to these things, and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Again, the blueprint from Isaiah chapter, chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, where was this kingdom to be established? In Jerusalem. It's so where the word of the Lord from would come from. Where was the church of Jesus to be established? From where was the word of God to be preached? From Jerusalem. Jesus charged the apostles, because keep in mind that's who he's talking to in this passage of Luke chapter 24. He charged the apostles with beginning in Jerusalem and going forward from there. He gave further instruction in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. It says, but, she, but ye shall receive power. Who is the ye? The apostles. The apostles shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So we see the process by which this, uh, the revelation of this mystery was to occur. The apostles would be given power by the Holy Ghost. They were to preach in Jerusalem, next in Judea, next in Samaria, and then after that to the uttermost part of the world. 
Then in Acts chapter 2, we see the first recorded gospel sermon preached by the apostles. Where was it delivered? In Jerusalem. Acts chapter 2 verse 5. Later on, we would see that Stephen, we refer to him as a mortar, he would serve as a catalyst for the instructions of Jesus, not to belittle his death, <clears throat> excuse me, not to belittle his death, but his death resulted in the scattering and ultimately brought a single man on the scene. You see, the, the sermon of Stephen offended many people, and as a result, he was murdered for it. Yet in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, <clears throat> we're introduced to a man named Saul. It says, And Saul was consenting unto his death, that is, Stephen's death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. What was the process by which this mystery was to be revealed? Started in Jerusalem, then to Judea, then to Samaria. It took the death of Stephen <clears throat> and the persecution that would follow to cause these early Christians to maintain that process. Now what were these people doing as they scattered abroad? In Acts chapter 8, but now in verses 4 and 5, it says, Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. <laughs> These Christians were revealing the mystery of Christ. Wherever these, these Christians went, so too the mystery of Christ. We are then told that Saul was converted to Christ in Acts chapter 9. Then in Acts chapter 10, we're introduced to the first Gentile converts, for they too obeyed the gospel. The mystery was revealed to them, and they believed the gospel. They obeyed it, and they became Christians. They became fellow heirs. Now, all of these things are part of the unfolding of God's plan for man's salvation. We see that the church of Christ was established in Jerusalem. We see that the mystery of Christ was preached to the Jews. And eventually it would spread to Judea, then to Samaria. Then the apostle to the Gentiles is converted, Saul, who would later be known as Paul. It is his ministry that would lead many of the Gentile world to Christ. He would preach the revelation of the mystery to them. And then you see that the Gentile world would flourish from the standpoint of converts, those entering the church. Now Jesus also gave instruction for the recording of this mystery. We must note that from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 through 13, it is impossible for man to know the mind of God. Verse 6, beginning, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. <clears throat> For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. 
Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual words. American Standard, 1901. We cannot know the mind of God except he reveals it to us. Who better to reveal the mind of God than the Spirit of God? Which is exactly what this text was pointing out. The apostles did not make up the gospel. However, they were directed by the Spirit of God to reveal, to present the revelation of this mystery to man. How was this all done? By the use of words. By the use of words. We see in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, that the Spirit speaks plainly. The Spirit speaketh expressly. The Spirit uses words. This is how we communicate. We understand this on our day-to-day -day activities. But this is how God communicates with mankind. Through His written, or now written, Word. We know that at one point, inspiration was once in men. This was done by the Holy Spirit. God gave miraculous gifts to men. These miraculous gifts were to be used in order to help grow and strengthen this new kingdom, the infant church of Christ. We could find in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 an outline of these gifts. <clears throat> Yet we must note in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verses 8 through 12 that these gifts would one day cease. You have to realize what their purpose was. And as we said, it was meant to help the early church grow, to help them understand better this mystery. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8, going through verse 12, it says, Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, speaking special knowledge that the apostles had, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly. But then, when the perfect is come, we see face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. The church at this particular time was an infant. However, it was expected to grow to adulthood. That was the purpose of these gifts, to aid this early church in growing. But once this church would grow, it would have no need for these miraculous gifts. The point at which that determined that would be the perfect that would come. Well, what is this perfect thing that would come? We find the answer of this in James chapter 1, verses 23 through 25. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. This is basically a divine commentary for 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 8-12. through 12. The perfect law of liberty would be or is the once unrevealed mystery, but now revealed. It would be the collected mind of God for mankind to follow. 
specifically the New Testament of Jesus Christ. This, I think, would add further depth to the passage found in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 8 through 16. I would encourage you to read that passage. We don't have time this morning. But we see that Jesus was resurrected upon, after his ascension. He would send the Holy Spirit as promised. This Holy Spirit gave miraculous gifts to men. These gifts would serve as a temporary crutch, a method of supplement, and it was done in order to allow enough time for the mystery of the gospel to be recorded. Once written down, these pages could be circulated in the churches. These writings would go on to be collected and compiled into a book. In fact, the book of all books, the Bible, it is a library in and of itself. It is the best library man can buy, can ever own. At this point, the church that Jesus promised to build and indeed did build would no longer be like a child tossed to and fro. Any issue that would arise, they wouldn't have to rely on somebody to tell them the will of God. They could thumb over. You know, I remember that was addressed in, in a letter. They could turn to that letter, make reference to the words used. This is what God says on such and such matter. Thus, we're able to have the statement, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for what? Doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect or complete, truly furnished unto some good works. No, God says all good works. This then unrevealed mystery allows mankind to be completely furnished for all good works. It supplies for every one of our spiritual needs. Now, as the Apostle Paul was doing his work, as we noted earlier, the church was a part of God's eternal purpose. We see throughout the life of Paul that he possessed great boldness, especially in teaching and in confidence in God throughout his years of ministry. Due to this, he wanted the church at, there at Ephesus to not focus on his current imprisonment. He didn't want that to be more of a concern to the Ephesians than the gospel itself. This persecution that he might have faced was considered to be glory for these Gentiles, these brethren that he had, our brethren from long ago. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 13, Wherefore I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. How could this be such glory? How could any predicament like this be considered glory? Well, Paul says that it was an opportunity for him to share the mystery of Christ. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 19 through 20. Whenever the gospel of Christ is revealed, God's exalted position for the Gentiles is likewise made known. Same is true today. We today should exhibit this same boldness of Paul, not only as we deal with the easy times that we face, but especially in those difficult times. Paul was facing imprisonment. He was just as bold as he was prior. We need to have the same boldness and confidence in God through our faith in Christ. We as members of the church are a demonstration of God's manifold wisdom and is supplied to us through the mystery of Christ that has been revealed, Christ's saving gospel. Now this revelation of the mystery tells that even Gentiles can be fellow heirs. They can become part of the same spiritual body. 
and thus they can become partakers of God's promise in Christ by obeying the gospel. They heard Paul's words, which were ultimately God's word. They believed in Christ as the Messiah, as the very Son of God. They repented of their sins. They confessed Christ. And ultimately, they were baptized for the remission of their sins. We, too, when we follow that pattern, we, too, become partakers of God's promise. Then it's expected of us to remain faithful to God, Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Upon our death... If we've been faithful to God, we can expect the crown of life that He's promised through His Word. So if this applies to you, if you're an alien of the commonwealth, if you're not a Christian, if you have not obeyed the gospel of Christ, why not take steps this day to obey that gospel, to be saved just like our Ephesians or our brethren of, in Ephesus? Why not be saved by obeying the gospel of Christ? However, if you are a child of God, but you've allowed sin to come into your life, why not put it away by obeying the gospel in a different sense? We typically refer to that as the second law of pardon. Repentance and prayer. Confess your faults. God has promised that he would forgive us. If either of these apply to you, make it known now as together we stand and sing.